Hi, my name is Paul Coco. My ID is M-I-D-N-C-O-C-O. -C -O. I wanted to share with you guys a um, project that I've completed this last fall in uh, designing a tricopter from the ground up. So basically what I did was I um, uh, you know, looked into did some research on tricopters and looked at you know the different methods that people use to build these things, um, whether it was component selection, how to calculate the length of the arm, flight performance, and actually put some engineering principles behind it in order to uh, design one of these. And the, you know the results were uh, kind of interesting. I've been in the, the hobby for uh, quite some time, and a couple years ago, I came across a uh, um, a website where uh, a guy from Sweden actually built one of these. It uh, got me hooked, um, especially since at the same time my wife uh, limited my use of um, buying new airplanes. So since I had a bunch of extra motors uh, lying around, I uh, made one of these from scratch, and it was—I uh, must say—it was quite impressive uh, the way this handled in the air. So you know, I, I was definitely hooked after that. So um, again, this uh, tricopter that I built, uh, everything was commercial off the shelf. I actually used uh, AP uh, M1 uh, Adreno. Uh, board with various different sensors, uh, GoPro camera, I made a uh, parachute recovery system, uh, telemetry and uh, first person view, um, commercially available LiPo batteries, you know, the whole nine. So I'll go over, you know, this um, This is a multi-page report, obviously it's uh, around 60 pages or so. Um, looked at various different things, you know, obviously an intro, um, dynamic flight control, component selection, tricopter design, which we'll talk about today, flight performance, flight control, and system modeling. Now for the uh, the flight controller, um, I did some basic modifications, but I basically used was, uh, what was commercially available out there. So, um, you know, nothing too, uh, you know, confounding there. Um, but, you know, I, I figured the tricopter design will be of interest, so we'll go over that today. So, um, let me get there. Looking at this, I actually had to do a lot of explanation of you know the tricopter function and, and what a tricopter does. Since uh, from the academic perspective, a lot of people have started doing you know design research projects on multi-copters, but you know from the uh, the quadcopters perspective. But I thought tricopters were a lot neater in the air and had a lot more complexity and versatility compared to your traditional quad. Plus, you know, one less motor since I'm cheap, so it all works out great. So in order to design this, uh, I looked at two different designs. I looked at the T and the Y tricopter. I decided to go with the uh, Y because of the fact for as I had to do an analysis on one arm, I can go ahead and extrapolate that on the other arm since all the arms would be at the given same length and have some type of uh, equal angles uh, geometrically apart from each other, obviously. Whereas the T, you know, you'd have two different lengths of angles and then you'd have different components on each of the arms. Um, here, so it would be a, a lot more of a, I guess, a lot more engineering computation in order to calculate what exactly was going on there. So, in order to do this, um, I looked at two different things. So, the biggest problem that people have with this is, you know, obviously the vibrations, and those vibrations could overcome the function of your flight controller. So, you essentially want to design one of these things of off the material that would dissipate as much of the vibrations as possible, while being strong. So if you ask yourself the question, where do the vibrations come from, obviously it's going to be the motor. So you have to determine that the motors that you're going to be using based on the configuration that they're in aren't, are, are first properly balanced and don't go in resonance in your particular flight envelope. And once you establish that, you need to also establish that the material and the given length that you're using doesn't also generate some type of resonance. So you know, I'll go ahead and show how I, how I went ahead and do, to do this. So the first thing I was looking at the various different materials I could use. So I did a strength and fatigue analysis on each one of these and uh, did a research. So the fatigue analysis, you know, is basically looking at the amount of cycles that you have towards failure. Now, since obviously this is, you know, some type of rod that's attached to a, a rotating uh, motor, you're going to have a lot of cycles. So you're eventually going to, you know, reach failure. You know, it's just face it that these tricopters or multi-copters wouldn't last forever because eventually you'll have a small microscopic crack that will go ahead and grow over time. So the canyon material that I looked at was aluminum, carbon fiber, and wood. So these are basically uh, figures from various different papers I decided to put together in one graph. And I looked at the fatigue cycles uh, for the percent ultimate tensile strength of aluminum, carbon fiber, and wood. And you can see that carbon fiber has a pretty steep drop and then settles out around mid 
cycles over here until it reaches the end of cycles. To whereas, you know, wood and aluminum are pretty much on par until midway. Aluminum drops drastically and wood will finish up pretty much where the um, carbon fiber ends up. Now, what does this get us? If you can actually see, you know, which on this bottom graph, you can see that the ultimate tensile strength for carbon fiber is 232, aluminum is 36, and wood is 100. So this is how that would compare. You see, it's even though that you have a pretty steep <laughs> drop in uh, carbon fiber initially, it's still, you know, multiple times greater than, you know, the other two material. One of the issues I did find with carbon fiber is that the carbon fiber that I'm using is, uh, you know, re really good stock. It's from uh, Hobby King, and it's basically the 10.5 uh, by 10.5 square um, uh, rods, or square, um, yeah, the square rods that have, you know, the hollow 8 millimeter uh, circular entrance inside. And those are actually pretty good to use. So um, the only issue that I found is that once you start tapping holes in it in order to attach motors or various different things, you would go ahead and put a pre essentially a flaw in there, and it would... If you had any good size impacts that it would actually split down the seams and basically break on you so in order to alleviate that I ended up coming up with a design where I got a wooden dowel that was slightly under a hair under 0.8 millimeters and actually lubed it up pretty good with uh, Gorilla Glue and then shoved it inside so then when I poked uh, penetrations to the carbon fiber the wood it would actually hold the seams from the inside and you know the screws or whatever bolting material that I would put would actually put all the stress basically on the wood which you know wood is is you know pretty resilient and good for so it's basically the best of both worlds so in doing this I actually had to develop a frame and let me go ahead and zoom in on this I, de I developed a frame to where I was able to suspend a motor in the middle of it as you can see now the uh, interesting part about this is that I want to harmonically isolate any type of vibrations coming out from the motor. So in industry and when you're doing design research projects, this is typically the type of setup that you would see. You would see some type of pipe or some type of component uh, hooked up with bungee cords and you would go ahead and you know measure the vibrations in the frame and then use small little accelerometers on the component to actually see what the vibrations were doing. Now obviously these motors were pretty small to begin with, so in order to measure the vibrations that I had on this, I actually had to go to Fun Sparks, and I actually got a um, a three-channel data logger, which is about the size of the quarter. Uh, it was powered by about a 90 milliamp uh, battery, and then I got a uh, three-axis uh, accelerometer, which I put on the bottom, and it recorded pretty well. Um, in order to record what my throttles uh, were doing and what the ESC was actually doing for power, I actually used one of the um, Turnigy Smart uh, Brains from Hobby King in order to record everything. And then in conjunction with the data from the uh, data logger that I had strapped in the bottom of the motor while I was running the test along with you know the throttles, I was actually come up, able to come up with a, uh, you know, some pretty decent graphs of what type of accelerations versus throttle positions and actually get RPMs on where the actual resonance has actually occurred. Now, um, in order to figure out what the frame was doing and that, that the uh, bungee cords were actually doing their job dissipating everything, I actually had this uh, nice little program on my iPhone called iVibra uh, Vibration Meter and I actually was able to pick up the accelerations and they were extremely small and negligible so the setup was uh, pretty nice and valid in order to do this. You know the iPhone is pretty remarkable, it has a 3-axis gyro accelerometer, it's got a camera GPS so essentially you have everything there for a uh, flight controller and first person view so I wouldn't be surprised if in the next year or two you have some clown now just put up a docking station onto a tricopter and basically fly their tricopter, you know, off their iPhone, which, you know, it's just, you know, the technology is amazing. It's thanks to these guys while, why, you know, the hobby's gotten so much affordable. Um, a couple of years ago, before they came along, you know, getting an accelerometer um, or these three axis gyros would have been 10 times the price of what they are now. But since, you know, these phones are in such high demand, they dropped the price. So thanks, Apple. So basically what I did was I have the uh, motor profile over here along with the accelerations and I came up with a basically a throttle versus acceleration curve you can see that from this curve uh, with the no load motor condition at about 57% throttle I had a resonance and then again around 80 now understand that you know these motors were uh, balanced and I used four different motors in order for 
motors but of the same brand in order to get these graphs. Now obviously I have a tricopter LED3 so I use an extra motor because I like to keep one in a spare in case something happened. So you know you can go ahead and dynamically balance these motors all you want. In reality you know you, you're going to end up reaching some type of resonance somewhere. You just want to make sure that that resonance isn't going to be in the area that you're operating in. So then I got the data from the speed controller and from my um, my uh, transmitter and plot the actual curves here. So you can see that I have these curves over here. This is where everything fell. So if I look again over here, my first resonance happens around 57%. 57% over here corresponds to about 10,000 RPM. I went again and repeated this test, but with the load propeller. And lo and behold, very similar curve. As you can see over here, I use a 10.8 propeller. I can go ahead and explain that later on within the, uh, the flight performance section to where around 10,000 RPM is gonna be above the scope of where I, I was at because a uh, loaded propeller spinning at 100% throttle came up to just under 9,000 RPM. So I didn't have to worry about resonance from the actual motor itself. So, you know, the motors were balanced and I was able to use, you know, within that level. So, you know, I was, I was pretty happy with that. Now, the next thing I had to do was look at the materials I selected either wood, aluminum, carbon fiber, and then make that determination whether operating within this spectrum would actually incur any type of um, resonance to occur. Now, in order to do that, you know, um, we had various different models out there, so I decided to use a cantilever beam um, fixed on one end, free on the other. You know, I could have used the mass on the other end, but I assume that, you know, because I'm generating a lift off that mass at the end, which would be the motor, that the mass of the motor would essentially cancel out. Now, you know, just for kicks, I went and did the calculation again with the motor, and the numbers were pretty much the same. So in order to come up with this, I need a couple things. E, which is the modulus, elasticity, which is material property. E, which is the, mo uh, the area moment of inertia, which is basically, you know, the, uh, the dimensions of the item. L, which is the length, again, dimensions, and D is the density, or rho is the density, which is, um, again, another material property. So here we go, use the uh, master's level vibrational analysis, and some people might, uh, that are in the field might not recognize this. Um, again, I, in the appendix, in the appendices, I have about five pages of derivations to come up with these numbers, and I come up with the natural frequency. Now with this natural frequency, this natural frequency is corresponding to the RPMs of the motors. And I was able to determine where the natural frequency was based off the material properties of the given length. So then I come up with this graph right over here, and this is the, uh, I guess the money graph that people have been asking me about that have seen this report. Let me go ahead and zoom out a little. Don't mind the typo on top, this is a rotor arm versus natural frequency. So basically I enveloped my flight envelope. I know that I was slightly over um, underneath uh, 9,000 RPM for my flight envelope, and I figured that the bottom half of the envelope would be at about 1,500, and I know that I didn't want to make the, an arm length greater than a meter long, so I decided to have my maximum length there. So I came up with these curves based off of the material properties and that equation that I just produced based off the cantilever beam. And I determined, well, here we have wood, carbon fiber, and aluminum. For this configuration, wood would go into resonance in your flight envelope if it were a length greater than about maybe 0.27 meters. Um, for the aluminum, it was a slightly under 0.4 and about 0.45 for carbon fiber, which kind of jives with what people have been designing and building out there. So, you know, I'm pretty, pretty uh, happy with these numbers. Now, in order to take this step further, I went ahead and I cut a piece of each of the material, about uh, 0.45 lengths, and I used my handy dandy little accelerometer on the bottom of the motor, and then I did basically full load testing. And this graph is the graph I came up with with the transmissibility of the candidate material. I ran a running average curve for each one of these. Similar setup as I was before, except for the motor wasn't mounted harmonically isolated from you know, the frame, it was actually mounted onto the material for the given length that I decided to choose. And you can see that, you know, around, you know if I chose wood, um, which is green, around 60% I would hit a resonance. Uh, aluminum gets kind of hairy about 65, and then I'm in full resonance, you know, around 70. And then, you know, the running average for 
carbon fiber does pretty decent up till towards you know the end where you have slightly higher uh, transmissions through there now the fact that we have a, a you want to keep these within a ratio of one or lower if it's a great ratio greater than one then the materials amplifying the vibrations if it's less than one then it's absorbing the vibrations. so I was pretty happy with my selection of carbon fiber and this is the data in order to uh, support it so um, this is all I have for uh, this section like I said I have multiple other sections which I explain um, you know various uh, different things for the design research paper um, if you have any questions uh, let me know um, um, yeah, and that's that's all I have. Uh, thanks for uh, watching, and uh, stay tuned for the uh, subsequent parts of this. Bye.